Welcome to BEFM Drama, where we turn great literature into gripping radio. Today we're turning to the works of the American writer Ambrose Bierce, a veteran of many of the most brutal battles of the American Civil War, which remains the deadliest war in U.S. history. Ambrose Bierce is regarded as an early influencer on American realism and as a major influence on later writers like Ernest Hemingway. Bierce's stories are dark, brutal, and dripping with a cruel sense of irony, influenced by the brutality and randomness of war. Today we're bringing you the conclusion of One of the Missing, a story that clearly demonstrates Bierce's tendency towards irony and dark humor. Jerome Searing, a Northern Union scout and sniper, has found himself trapped in a nightmarish situation. After the building he was taking shelter in was struck by a stray cannon shell, Jerome Searing has found himself pinned helplessly in the rubble, with his loaded and cocked rifle pointed squarely at the center of his forehead. Any movement might set the weapon off, and the unfortunate soldier is helpless to save himself. That night, Jerome Searing could not sleep. Gradually, he became aware of a pain in his forehead, a dull ache, hardly perceptible at first, but growing more and more uncomfortable. He opened his eyes and it was gone, closed them and it returned. The devil, he said irrelevantly, and stared again at the sky. He heard the singing of birds, the strange metallic note of the meadow lark, suggesting the clash of vibrant blades. He fell into pleasant memories of his childhood, played again with his brother and sister, raced across the fields, shouting to alarm the sedentary larks, entered the somber forest beyond, and with timid steps followed the faint path to Ghost Rock, standing at last with audible heartthrobs before the dead man's cave and seeking to penetrate its awful mystery. For the first time, he observed that the opening of the haunted cavern was encircled by a ring of metal. Then all else vanished and left him gazing into the barrel of his rifle as before. But whereas before it had seemed nearer, it now seemed an inconceivable distance away, and all the more sinister for that. He cried out, startled by something in his own voice, the note of fear, lied to himself in denial. If I don't sing out, I may stay here till I die. He made now no further attempt to evade the menacing stare of the gun barrel. If he turned away his eyes an instant, it was to look for assistance, although he could not see the ground on either side of the ruin. And he permitted them to return, obedient to the imperative fascination. If he closed him, it was from weariness, and instantly the poignant pain in his forehead, the prophecy and menace of the bullet, forced him to reopen them. The tension of nerve and brain was too severe. Nature came to his relief with intervals of unconsciousness. Reviving from one of these, he became aware of a sharp, smarting pain in his right hand, and when he worked his fingers together or rubbed his palm with them, he could feel that they were wet and slippery. He could not see the hand, but he knew the sensation. It was running blood. In his delirium, he had beaten it against the jagged fragments of the wreckage, had clutched it full of splinters. He resolved that he would meet his fate more manly. He was a plain, common soldier, had no religion and not much philosophy. He could not die like a hero, with great and wise last words, even if there had been someone to hear them. But he could die game, and he would. But if only he could know when to expect the shot. Some rats, which had probably inhabited the shed, came sneaking and scampering about. One of them mounted the pile of debris that held the rifle. Another followed, and another. Searing regarded them at first with indifference, then with friendly interest. Then, as the thought flashed into his bewildered mind that they might touch the trigger of his rifle, he cursed them and ordered them to go away. It is no business of yours, he cried. The creatures went away. They would return later, attack his face, gnaw away his nose, cut his throat. He knew that, but he hoped by that time to be dead. Nothing could now unfix his gaze from the little ring of metal in its black interior. The pain in his forehead was now fierce and incessant. He felt it gradually penetrating the brain more and more deeply until at last its progress was arrested by the wood at the back of his head. It grew momentarily more insufferable. He began wantonly beating his lacerated hand against the splinters again to counteract that horrible ache in his head. It seemed to throb with a slow, regular recurrence, each pulsation sharper than that preceding it, 
and sometimes he cried out, thinking he felt the fatal bullet. No thoughts of home, of wife, of children, of country, of glory. The whole record of memory was erased. The world had passed away. Not a vestige remained. Here, in this confusion of timbers and boards, is the sole universe. Here is immortality and time, each pain and everlasting life. The throbs tick off eternities. Jerome Searing, this man of courage, the formidable enemy, the strong, resolute warrior, was as pale as a ghost. His jaw was fallen, his eyes protruded, he trembled in every fiber. A cold sweat bathed his entire body. He screamed with fear. He was not insane. He was terrified. In groping about with his torn and bleeding hand, he had seized at last a strip of board and pulling felt it give way. It lay parallel with his body, and by binding his elbow as much as the contracted space would permit, he could draw it a few inches at a time. Finally, it was altogether loosened from the wreckage covering his legs. He could lift it clear of the ground the whole length. A great hope came into his mind. Perhaps he could work it upward, that is to say, backwards, far enough to lift the end and push aside the rifle. Or, if that were too tightly wedged, so place a strip of board as to deflect the bullet. With this goal, he passed it backward, inch by inch, hardly daring to breathe lest that act somehow defeat his intent, and more than ever unable to remove his eyes from the rifle which might perhaps now hasten to improve its waning opportunity. Something at least had been gained. In the occupation of his mind in this attempt at self-defense, he was less aware of the pain in his head and had ceased to wince. But he was still dreadfully frightened and his teeth rattled like castanets. The strip of board had ceased to move. He tugged at it with all his strength, changed the direction of its length all he could, but it had met some extended obstruction behind him and in the end was still too heavy to clear away the pile of debris and reach the muzzle of the gun. It extended, indeed, nearly as far as the trigger guard, which, uncovered by the rubbish, he could imperfectly see with his right eye. He tried to break the strip with his hand, but he had no leverage. In his defeat, all his terror returned, augmented tenfold. The black aperture of the rifle appeared to threaten a sharper and more imminent death and punishment of his rebellion. The track of the bullet through his head ached with an intenser anguish. He began to tremble again. Suddenly, he became composed. His tremor subsided. He clenched his teeth and drew down his eyebrows. He had not exhausted his means of defense. A new design had shaped itself in his mind, another plan of battle. Raising the front end of the strip of board, he carefully pushed it forward through the wreckage at the side of the rifle until it pressed against the trigger guard. Then he moved the end slowly outward until he could feel that it had cleared it. Then, closing his eyes, thrust it against the trigger with all his strength. There was no explosion. The rifle had been fired as it dropped from his hand when the building fell. But it did its work. Lieutenant Adrian Searing, in command of the picket guard on that part of the line through which his brother Jerome had passed on his mission, sat with attentive ears in a breastwork behind the line. Not the faintest sound escaped him. The cry of a bird, the barking of a squirrel, the noise of the wind among the pines, all were anxiously noted by his overstrained senses. Suddenly, directly in front of his line, he heard a faint, confused rumble, like the clatter of a falling building translated by distance. The lieutenant mechanically checked his watch. Six o'clock and eighteen minutes. At the same moment, an officer approached him on foot from the rear and saluted. Lieutenant, the colonel directs you to move forward your line and feel the enemy if you find him. If not, continue the advance until directed to halt. There is reason to think that the enemy has retreated. The lieutenant nodded and said nothing. The other officer retired. In a moment, the men, appraised of their duty by the non-commissioned officers in low tones, had deployed from their rifle pits and were moving forward in skirmishing order, with set teeth and beating hearts. This line of skirmishers sweeps across the plantation toward the mountain. They pass on both sides of the wrecked building, observing nothing. At a short distance in their rear, their commander comes. He casts his eyes curiously upon the ruin and sees a dead body half buried in boards and timbers. It is so covered with dust that its clothing is confederate gray. Its face is yellowish white, 
The cheeks are fallen in, the temples sunk in two, with sharp ridges around them, making the forehead forbiddingly narrow. The upper lip, slightly lifted, shows the white teeth rigidly clenched. The hair is heavy with moisture. The face is wet and dewy as the grass all about. From his point of view, the officer does not observe the rifle. The man was apparently killed by the fall of the building. The officer spoke curtly. Dead a week. Moving on and absently pulling out his watch as if to verify his estimate of time. Six o'clock and forty minutes. And so we come to the end of our story. And another example of Ambrose Bierce's strange relationship with time. Jerome Searing's ordeal was so overwhelming and nightmarish that the stress of it warped his facial features so badly that even his own brother failed to recognize his body as he passed the side of the ruined building. The officer in charge notes casually that Jerome Searing must have been dead for at least a week to look the way he does, when in reality, it's been only 20 minutes since he died. One of the missing demonstrates all of the classic hallmarks of Ambrose Bierce's work, and holds up today as a brilliant and still modern example of the storyteller's craft. From BEFM Drama, this is your host, Joshua Cornwell. <laughs>